the new prime minister, any of these who, who become prime minister, will be very committed in the campaign that's about to happen to making a success of Brexit, you know, having a new great intense effort to make a success of Brexit with all the difficulties that it's created for the UK economy and really adopting the agenda of innovation and science and the best regulation of fintech or artificial intelligence. Good day, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining today's edition of Taneo Insights. I'm Kevin Kajiwara with Taneo Political Risk Advisory in New York City. Last Thursday, July the 7th, the United Kingdom's Prime Minister Boris Johnson uh, announced his intention to resign. Two years and 348 days into his premiership. Incidentally, the same tenure as Neville Chamberlain, uh, who was ousted by uh, Winston Churchill. Uh, Johnson's time as prime minister, marked though it was by controversy, was certainly not without its bright, sto- uh, bright spots, not least, of course, uh, the procurement of COVID-19 vaccines, uh, as well as, uh, as Prime Minister Johnson's leading support, moral, material, and diplomatic uh, for, for Ukraine. But in the end, scandal ultimately pushed the prime minister from the asset side of the ledger to the liability side of the uh, Tory ledger. Uh, And we saw that play out in real time, uh, starting July the 5th, when two senior cabinet ministers, uh, Sajid Javid and the chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, Rishi Sunak, resigned. Uh, And at that point, the exodus came so fast and furiously that the BBC actually had to run a uh, on-screen ticker. Um, I am joined today by by two colleagues who are familiar to many of you in the audience uh, to help us consider what this means for the United Kingdom uh, and its place in the world. Lord Haig of Richmond is here, probably best known in the U.S. as the United Kingdom's Foreign Secretary from 2010 to 2014, but as important, uh, particularly for today's conversation, he was the leader of the Conservative Party from 1997 to 2001. He served in the House of Commons for 26 years until he stood down in 2015, and incidentally, his former seat is now held by Rishi Sunak, who is uh, one of those standing to replace Prime Minister Johnson. Today, in addition to his business and philanthropic interests and ventures, uh, William is a columnist with the Times of London. He's a senior advisor, and he is the chairman of the Royal Foundation of the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. Karsten Nickel is also here. He's a managing director with Taneo Political Risk Advisory. He's one of our heads of research based in London, uh, and he leads the firm's coverage uh, of the United Kingdom. So, so William, I know the, uh, and, and, and my apologies to our audience, we're starting a few minutes late today because the results of the first round of uh, determining Boris Johnson's successor have just been released. But before we get to where we are going next, I thought um, it would be good to start with just a little bit of your observations, William, of how we got here, your impressions of how we got here, and, and really this, the denouement, if you will, uh, of Boris Johnson's time uh, in Downing Street. Well, thank you, Kevin. Yes, and hello, everybody listening to us. And it is a remarkable thing that this prime minister who was so popular, uh, Boris Johnson, who won a landslide victory at the general election in 2019, somehow managed to throw it all away. And it's almost unique in British political history in not really being about policy. You know, when other prime ministers have been brought down, um, in um, in the middle of a, of an election term or between elections, uh, it's been about some policy they were pursuing. Uh, that was true of Margaret Thatcher, it was true of Theresa May trying to do Brexit, or because they've served a very long time, like Tony Blair, um, who partly left of his own accord. But this is really about personal failings of the prime minister about so the accusation that he failed to uphold the standards of the office, that he showed favoritism to people in trouble, that he didn't follow uh, the advice of ethics advisors, um, that he really damaged the reputation of his party and his government, that he couldn't be relied on to tell the truth, that he was being investigated by 
Commons Committee on whether he misled Parliament, which in Britain is regarded as the, uh, you know, one of the greatest political crimes. It was really this that brought him down, and what really triggered it was just what would have been quite a small scandal two weeks ago, but another one where he seemed to show favoritism that he wasn't dealing properly with an MP who'd done something wrong because he was one of his favorites. Um, and so this eventually tipped the Conservative Party over. They couldn't stand it anymore, largely because the voters were saying, we can't stand it anymore. And that was coming up through the ranks of the Conservative Party. Boris Johnson had um, lost some by-elections uh, disastrously, uh, was doing very badly personally in opinion polls. So this finally triggered this, this extraordinary thing, as you say, last week, where 50 ministers and ministerial aides resigned in 24 hours to try to force him out. In the end, that was successful. So a very British sort of coup uh, in the end. So it appears that Her Majesty the Queen will indeed be served by her, uh, by her 15th prime minister. Um, and considering her durability versus everyone else's, that may be uh, more to come after that, I suppose. But, you know, Karsten, um, the process of determining who will be the next, uh, the next head of the party and, and the next prime minister uh, is, is currently underway. And I know we'll talk in a few minutes about what that first vote has, uh, has yielded. But, but maybe before we, before we do that, can you set the stage for how this process looks like it's going to play out over the next few weeks, sort of from a technical uh, uh, perspective? Sure. I mean, it's, it's fairly straightforward because you have basically two sets of players here. You have the uh, conservative uh, parliamentary party, so the MPs in, in, in the House of Commons, and then you have the, the grassroots, the party membership across, across the country. Um, and first of all, the ball is in the, in the court of the, of the MPs, so they are whittling this list down. Uh, um, from 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 eight to six today, we we just got the got the result of the of the first round to of, of voting. You were you were just alluding to that, um, uh, Kevin, um, and that that will continue over the coming uh, over the coming days uh, until the, the the summer recess uh, begins at the at the end of next week um, here here in Westminster, and at that point we should have made it down to to two remaining contenders, and they then effectively um, engage in an electoral campaign, if you like, within the within the conservative. Uh, within the Conservative Party, um, with a membership ballot um, at, at the end of that. Um, and the result of that should be that we have uh, one winner of this contest who can then take over um, uh, as Prime Minister, as leader of the Conservative Party, and therefore Prime Minister, given that we have this um, uh, impressive, really, uh, Conservative majority in the House of Commons, uh, in time for um, foreign MPs coming back from the, from the summer recess, which is uh, on the 5th of, of September. And just to clarify, because given most of our audience is obviously here in the United States, so just to just to clarify exactly how this democracy works, the the conservative members of parliament are going to narrow this down to the two that you talk about by next Thursday. And then the, I don't know, a couple hundred thousand uh, or what have you, members of the conservative party throughout the country will then vote on those final two, and that will determine who, the, unless one of them were to stand down in the interim, um, that will determine who the, uh, as opposed to a direct vote um, by the by the people, correct? Yeah, exactly. And the, uh, I mean, it's, 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 an, it's an interesting point that, that you're making there, uh, right, regarding uh, one of the two remaining contenders standing down. I mean, that was that was exactly the situation that we that we had in, in, in 2016, when it was um, Theresa May against Andrea Letzem, and uh, Andrea Letzem decided to, to stand down. So this was ultimately decided without um, a party membership ballot, but I think there's, there's uh, very much the, the desire uh, in, in the wider party leadership this time to actually take this to the membership and to have that conversation. And I'm sure we'll be, we'll be touching upon that um, in, in the course of this call, this conversation that is very much necessary, I would say, within the Conservative Party about where members uh, want this party to go. And um, one final uh, point of order question. Uh, some commentators have referred to Boris Johnson remaining um, uh, in Downing Street as kind of a caretaker prime minister. But the reality in the UK is, is that there is there's no difference between a, the, 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 the lame duck prime minister and what he had before. It all comes down, his ability to maneuver all comes down to parliamentary math. Not, there, there's, no, there's no constitutional, let's say, constraint on him at this, at this, at this point. 
Yeah, exactly. There's, right. there's, there's no exactly. There, there's no formal. There's no formal limit. And then at the same time, um, uh, it, it is simply the case that we're going to have a new prime minister in the moment the Queen asks somebody else to form a new government, and that will obviously only happen uh, once this conservative le uh, leadership election has been has been decided. So, William, you know, <laughs> I know that you were you were amongst the very first to educate me on this notion that when it comes to Westminster uh, politics. You know, whoever wields the knife rarely winds up wearing the crown, um, and it can be a fool's errand uh, to make firm predictions at this uh, at the outset of the process. But but um, you know, we've had the first round of uh, of, of voting um, am amongst the conservative MPs, as Karsten mentioned. Uh, eight, the initial eight, has now been whittled down to 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 six. Um, so uh, let's have some fun here, and let's start handicapping this uh, a, a bit, a bit, a bit from your from your vantage point, what do you what do you see? Well, I don't see a uh, shattering surprise here in the first ballot result that we just got, as you said, ten minutes ago. Uh, except perhaps in the order of some of the lower placed uh, candidates, uh, there's very uh, uh, candidates come onto the scene. Uh, Kemi Badenoch, uh, as not not known to the, many of the public until the last few days. And um, she's got 40 votes there, which means she can go on fighting, whereas a couple of bigger known names like Jeremy Hunt, who was runner up to Boris Johnson last time, three years ago, has been knocked out. But I think the overall pattern of the vote that's just come in is not very surprising that Rishi Sunak is out in front. 88 votes, and really, if you're if you're going to come top of a of a of a series of exhaustive ballots where there are 358 voters, you do want to be starting with about 80 or 90 in the first uh, vote. You know, to to have got uh, about a quarter of the total when there are eight candidates is a good sign. Um, but second place, strong second place, Penny Mordaunt. Um, who is popular with the party rank and file. The very interesting thing is that only 17 votes behind her is Liz Truss, the foreign secretary, because what this is shaping up to be, there's the instant reaction when you just look at those numbers and, and you're working out who the two are going to be that the party activists choose from, it looks like Rishi Sunak will almost certainly be one of them, I mean, just about certainly be one of them, um, but the, the other could be uh, one of these two women, Penny Mordaunt or Liz Truss. And the real fight in the next 24 hours or so is for Liz Truss to say to right-wing supporters of some of the other less successful candidates, you've got to back me now, so I overhaul Penny Mordaunt. Otherwise, there are going to be these two rather pragmatic conservatives in the final ballot. Um, Rishi Sunak and Penny Mordaunt, and the real, you know, what she will depict as um, the hardline Brexiteers won't be represented in the final ballot. So that's going to be, that's part of the dynamic that starts this evening in the House of Commons. Can Liz Truss overhaul Penny Mordaunt for second place as these ballots go on? You know, um, notwithstanding the caveat that I that I made earlier with regards to uh, to early handicapping, are you are you uh, are either of you surprised uh, at some of the people who who were much lower in the um, in, in in the voting, or is that uh, was that just sort of the nature of how this was going to play? Well, I'm not that. So I said it was. You know, there are, there are some surprise in the lower order, but I, I think um, a few weeks ago we would not have expected Jeremy Hunt to only get 18 um, votes. But he has struggled to get his campaign. He did a deal to make a certain MP deputy prime minister, who um, if that didn't go down well with the other members of parliament. Um, so it didn't. Now we've come to this evening. It's not a huge surprise. Um, what, what's what's going to be really interesting is now how the votes that are released by these candidates being pushed out, how they play, how they break between the leading candidates. And the other interesting thing is tonight, do any of the other candidates withdraw? It's gone down from eight to six candidates officially. Six are entitled to go through into the next round of voting. But that doesn't mean they always do so. Sometimes when they see that, okay, this isn't going to go, I'm not going to win this, 
they drop out and swing their support behind somebody else. Um, I don't know that that's going to happen uh, tonight, but it could. Uh, so that's another thing to look out for in the next 24 hours. But but what all this is probably people listening to us are thinking, what on earth is this leading to? Then who is going to be the prime minister at the end of all this? And it means it's probably you can see it coming down to three people now. I think Rishi Sunak, Liz Truss, Penny Mordaunt. Um, and it, the, the race in the, among the final two, this race that goes on, as, we were, as was being described, for six weeks among the party membership out in the country, that could still go in any direction among those candidates. Um, so um, that, that, there's, there's no clear, that it's not possible to say, as it was possible to say in some previous leadership elections, oh, Boris Johnson is going to win this, we could say three years ago at this point. Theresa May is going to win this, we could say three years before. We're not in a position tonight to say that. We can only narrow it down, I think, to three candidates. And perhaps echoing that, um, I think to me, the, 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 the fragmentation of the right within the Conservative Party here as it speaks out of those results. I think that is something that we have seen developing, obviously, over the last couple of days, so it's not, it's not a surprise. Um, but I think that is really noteworthy, and it is something to watch um, over the summer, because I think there is the real risk. So as, as William Hague was, was pointing out, you could end up with a scenario where basically two, let's say, more centrist candidates battle it out. Um, and at the same time, you have this very powerful constituency uh, within the party, the right not being represented in it just because it has been internally internally fragmented, uh, which obviously doesn't bode well for you know if, if you wanted to uh, effectively some address some of those bigger underlying structural policy questions about where where this party wants wants to go. Yes, yes, I absolutely agree with that. There's a there's an extraordinary thing about the Conservative Party that of these eight candidates. Only two are white males. Now, this what a change in a Conservative Party. 25 years ago this year, when I was elected leader of the Conservative Party, there were five of us who were candidates, and we were all white males. Um, but today, in the British Conservative Party, um, the, the candidates, half the candidates are from ethnic minorities, half the candidates are women. Um, and um, but there is this uh, fragmentation of the more right wing candidates. And it's another interesting thing from this result we just received that the fragmentation on the right continues because the candidates who are knocked out are more centrist candidates. And so it's still hard for the right to coalesce. That's why I say Liz Trust tonight will be saying to those candidates, you'd better pull out and swing behind me because otherwise we're going to end up with, um, you know, with people who are less hardline on the Northern Ireland Protocol, for instance, on the, this very difficult issue being negotiated with the EU. Um, Liz, Liz Trust Foreign Secretary is a real hardliner on that, and uh, she will be saying to those right-wing MPs, you better swing behind me now because it's me or these two people who, you know, you might not find are as, uh, as tough on the EU as I'm going to be. So I want to unpack uh, what you guys have both just been talking about here for a second. And, and in a few minutes, let me assure you, we're going to get to where, you know, the, 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 the situation that the United Kingdom finds itself confronting, irrespective of who, um, uh, of who sits in Downing Street. But sticking with the candidate here to just for, for a moment, you know, William, you point out, um, and I think it's lost on, on nobody, the, the sort of uh, the amazing diversity uh, of, the, um, of, the, of the candidates. However, from a from a, you know when you kind of go to the fifty thousand foot level, the the policy diversity isn't really particularly there, right? I mean, all you're hearing about right now is the promise of tax cuts in this economic environment. Tax cuts. Most would uh, it seems to me would renege on the uh, on the EU Northern Ireland uh, deal. Many would continue shipping illegal immigrants um, to 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 Rwanda. Um, so, um, but I'm wondering, you know, as we as we approach the more, you know, to your point, as the as the as, as Liz Truss perhaps tries to uh, to gather support from uh, from from the other th th those who haven't gotten as many votes, and and certainly when we get it down to two, and those two go on the road to try to sell the party rank and file, do do these sort of does this very limited spectrum of daylight that we seem to see policy wise 
does that start to, to look more like a chasm? I mean, will those differences really start to, to, to emerge? Actually, I think the policy differences might even narrow a bit further. You're quite right that um, there aren't huge policy differences except on tax. This is because of the point I was making earlier that Boris Johnson wasn't really brought down over policy. You know, when Theresa May was brought down as Prime Minister and Boris Johnson came in, that was because her policy had reached a dead end and he had a different Brexit policy. So, of course, change of leader meant a big change of policy. In this case, it's not policy that brought Boris Johnson down. So most of these people were happily pursuing the same policies uh, at the point this leadership election occurred. And therefore, they all have the same policy on Ukraine, for instance, on the war in Ukraine, that Britain should have a leading role. They are completely enthusiastic about the role Boris Johnson played uh, in that. They all officially have the same policy on the Northern Ireland Protocol. So what I was talking about earlier is only a difference of emphasis or perceived um, toughness, uh, as it were. Tax is the one area. Um, however, those candidates who have promised uh, uh, big tax cut, Liz Trust, uh, day one, we will have some sizable tax cuts, are under some pressure, including from people like me writing in the newspapers, to show that actually they're responsible and they're not going to go crazy. And the Rishi Sunak, who is on the side of we're fiscally conservative, you know, in the end we have to pay our debts and so on. He's under pressure to say, uh, well, it's only a case of when, not if, as he said yesterday. You know, it's when we have tax cuts, not if we have tax. So in a way, yeah. they're trying to narrow their differences. And this means the party activists, when they come to make their choice, will be heavily deciding about electability. Um, who is going to win a general election for the Conservative Party that's now been in power for 12 years, face another election in two years' time? I think that will be a major, probably the major factor for them. So that, that brings me to something, and I know, Karsten, you've written a lot about this, so I'd love to tee you up here, but also hear what William, uh, William thinks about this, because, you know, um, William, you, you've made this point now several times that, that that Boris was not brought down by these by by policy differences um, and that essentially they're all kind of lining up and, and things like, you know, Brexit, which I think is increasingly being shown to be a, a burden on the on the British economy, but is baked in as party orthodoxy uh, now. But but Karsten, you've talked a lot about the ultimate reckoning, this reconciliation that ultimately has to happen. Uh, in the in the in the Conservative Party, because the the election that uh, that 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 brought Boris Johnson to power, you know, you've got this the traditional conservatives in southeast uh, in, in southeast England uh, who are the low tax, low spend, low regulatory touch, the sort of the the the, the, the traditional Tories, and then. You've got this more blue collar industrial heartland of uh, former labor voters and um, who want something completely different oftentimes out of government, particularly on the fiscal largesse side, that that though that has to be reconciled at, at, at some point between now and a national election. So uh, to explain that dynamic a little bit and where you see the, the, this current dynamic playing into that. Yeah, and that is, I mean, I think that is basically the the, the next point that 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 you could add to the to the list um, uh, that that William Hague was was just presenting, right? List of of, of items that that all the leadership contenders basically have in common. I, I think the the additional point they all have in common is they I think don't really have any idea of how you bring that new voter coalition, which is now backing this party, how you bring that together. And in their defense, I mean it's 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 a it's a very it's a very difficult ask, right? Uh it is it is it's really been a voter coalition that has been brought together by this let's say charismatic leadership style by by Boris Johnson who has been campaigning on that promise of Brexit, which was this one issue that united these other, other, otherwise very, very, very difficult and dif different um, uh, constituencies uh, uh, behind voting, voting for the conservatives. And ever since we have been, we have been in crisis fighting mode, right? Um, negotiating Brexit uh, from there straight into, into the pandemic. Uh, and now, obviously, the, the war in Ukraine and the inflation and, and, and cost of, cost of living story with the, with the result that the kind of the, 
the, the underlying policy work that you would want to happen, right, to kind of like, let's say, underpin such a, such a new coalition, that obviously hasn't happened before the last election. It was basically Brexit was the selling point at that one over these two very different constituencies. And since then, nobody, nobody has worked um, on, on, on a policy platform that could over the longer term um, uh, unite unite these these two constituency in a, in a constituencies in a in a more durable more durable fashion. And I think to to me, I, I would be very surprised if this leadership election now, now basically over one summer or overnight, if you like, um, would would resolve these questions. Because to your point, um, those voters who, who who have been won over with a more let's say culturally conservative pitch. Uh, further up north, they simply require greater spending on social services, and that will be very difficult to bring together uh, with an agenda of cutting taxes, which is, let's say, the more uh, traditional conservative mantra. And how you bridge that? Well, I mean, let, let's let's put it in a different way. Perhaps the best thing for this party, after more than a decade in power, would indeed be if it could have that conversation with itself for a slightly more prolonged period on the opposition benches. But that is obviously not where we are right now. William, your thoughts on that? Well, I think um, an interesting thing in British politics, despite all this uh, meltdown in the Conservative Party and so many people resigning last week, on the whole, the Conservative Party has only been a few points behind Labour in the opinion polls. And the Labour Party hasn't, also hasn't been able to get its electoral coalition back together uh, very effectively, isn't, isn't showing signs of that. So the next general election is still open um, in Britain and probably won't come until um, mid to late 2024. So it's all to play for in political terms. I think there is one um, important thing that will happen as a result of this election, which is the new prime minister, any of these who, who become prime minister, will be very committed in the campaign that's about to happen to making a success of Brexit, you know, having a new great intense effort to make a success of Brexit um, with all the difficulties that it's created for the UK economy um, and really adopting the agenda of innovation and science and the best regulation or fintech or artificial intelligence, whatever it may be, being in the UK. Now, quite a bit of work has gone on on this sort of thing since Brexit, but I, I know for a fact from my own conversations with them that Rishi Sunak or Penny Mordaunt will be very committed to showing they can make that work and lead that kind of agenda more effectively than Boris Johnson was. I don't know whether it will work, but I think that it will be an interesting new drive behind British government policy to sort of to demonstrate the competitive advantage of the UK or find new competitive advantages after Brexit to speed up financial services, uh, re reforms of financial services regulation, that sort of thing. So I think that that might be one policy outcome from the, it's not a change of policy, but a kind of a focus and an acceleration of policy that might come from the British government. Uh, I, but I completely agree with what Carsten was saying, and I think that the, this inability to um, um, to have a, an attractive spending policy that reconciles an attractive tax policy it means that, okay, there might be some fiscal loosening as a result of this election, but it would be relatively modest uh, fiscal loosening, and therefore not a um, not a massive change of tax policy. And, you know, William, you opened the door on on uh, on labor there for a moment. Maybe you could expand on that just a little bit, just your observations here. I mean, a, a, a couple of weeks ago, it appeared that the labor leader, Keir Starmer, was also under um, uh, it, it was that, that labor could lose its leader as well. Looks like he has weathered that storm. You know, but to your your point, you know, the the, the issues that um, you know, they're sort of the mirror image that uh, of what uh, of what the conservatives are going through that they have to reconcile before the next election. So uh, maybe expand a little bit on 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 what you see as a dynamic right now in, the, in in labor and how that might play out. Well, I think labor have, has improved its position. And um, uh, again, I, I've written about this where I give my free advice to the Labour Party as a former deputy. <laughs> Leader and basically saying, if you want to be elected, you have to be more like the German Social Democrats. 
Uh, show that you are fiscally responsible because the voters always have a fear that you're going to spend everything and run out of money very quickly. Um, and um, show that you're very reassuring in your policy positions across the board. Um, and, and that actually, that is what they have been doing under Keir Starmer. And they have really been distancing themselves from Jeremy Corbyn and the far left rhetoric of the last election. Though undoubtedly they're in a stronger position than the last election. What they haven't yet captured is a sense of being the future, you know, of um, because they're still not really. Uh, well, well, Keir Starmer made a speech last week accepting Brexit and saying, yeah, even we we take Brexit as a given. Now we're going to start to think positively about it. They're only just beginning that positive thinking. It's very difficult for them to do that. So they're struggling to capture a kind of future agenda for for Britain. Um, and um, I think when the Labour Party is struggling with a future, a, a vision of the future of the country, um, then the Labour Party struggles uh, in elections. That's when it gets elected, is when it's a wave of the future, like under Tony Blair. So that is a missing part of the Labour agenda. But there's no doubt they've moved into a more centrist position. Uh, they have been, um, there's all these paradoxical things happening in British politics. The Conservatives have become the most diverse uh, party in the way we've described, at least in leadership elections. The Labour Party has become the party criticising Conservative candidates for threatening to lose control of the economy, for promising too much. Uh, and they are now saying, we are going to have this very disciplined approach to spending and taxation. So um, that's an important step to making them electable, but it does not in itself get them elected. They need the positive ideas now as well. You know, as you look forward to that, and, and you know, one of the one of the interesting dynamics here in the United United States, of course, uh, has been that um, you know traditionally the Republican Party has been thought of as the, the pro business party. Um, you know, as this battle plays out in the Republican Party for the heart and soul of it, uh, it is not at all clear that that is the uh, that that is the case anymore. Um, and I, I wonder if you if, if, if you look forward to that next national election, notwithstanding the dynamic that both you and Karsten have been talking about here from a business perspective, especially for the multinational corporation perspective. Um, you know, wh where should their interest lie, in a sense, um, on the on the outcome of that uh, of the of the conservative labor dynamic? Well, I think there's a lot of um, in many ways, as you can gather from what we've just been describing, British politics is is um, has gravitated back to a consensus on a lot of things. So it's quite different from American politics. In this sense, we've had this big national split over Brexit, you know, nearly 50-50 split in a referendum. But now both main political parties' positions is Brexit is a given, Brexit has happened, we have to somehow make the most of it. Both of their positions, subject to the nuances in this leadership election, are um, spending, government spending has to rise on health and social care and defence. Um, and therefore, tax reductions are fairly tactical um, as a result. So their positions are quite similar and across a whole range of other issues. So I think that a lot of the business interest is um, for the next election is, well, who can actually bring to life the sort of thing I was just talking about? If, if the UK is going to be a center of innovation in, in fintech and in, in various areas, in life sciences, um, Who's really got the credible plans to bring together the innovation and the talent and the availability of capital uh, in the UK? Um, so actually not so much of a right-left question. The, the, the right-left division on economic matters is going to be much smaller at the next British election than at the last election. In a way, that's a sign of recovering some political... Stability, maybe stability in a worse national situation after Brexit. I say, as someone who opposed Brexit, but nevertheless, some policy stability—that's probably attractive in the business world. 
you know, Karsten, um, as we have headed toward the end of the Johnson, uh, the Johnson era, obviously all focus was on that, how that was going to play out and what was going to bring him down. Nothing else has really been happening that much. And then, of course, we're about to go on to the summer break and still have to determine ultimately who his successor is going to be. Yet whoever that is um, uh, in the UK faces um, some pretty big social and economic headwinds, right? So highest inflation in the G7, forecast to have the slowest growth among the G7 next year. Um, obviously, every London commuter knows there's industrial action brewing and spreading out there. There's a cost of living crisis uh, with an aging population. Um, and there's vast investment that's going to ultimately be required to meet climate targets and the like. What is really at the top of the agenda of it's going, that's going to be needed to be addressed by that incoming prime minister and his or her cabinet? I, I would say if, if you really wanted to sum this up to one point, I think it has been this headline term that has been out there and all of this. And that's the, that's the cost of living crisis, right? Because that's where all these kind of moving parts um, ultimately, ultimately come together. And of course, while it is true that the, the next general election is not tomorrow, obviously we're heading there, coming then out of the summer and coming out of that, um, out of that lead, uh, leadership, um, leadership contest. Uh, and I think that really is, is ultimately the thing that kind of like embodies all these, these challenges, um, that, 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 that you were pointing to, because this is, this is, this is the transmission mechanism, if, if, if you like, through which, through which all of this, these global politics, um, uh, these local politics um, and, and all of these unresolved questions ultimately hit, hit voters' voters' pockets. I think that that will be the absolute absolute focus, and I think that also explains ultimately why the focus has been in such a monothematic way over the last couple of days, really on that on that tax cut tax cuts conversation. And Karsten, um, you know, taking what William has been saying with regards to you know both parties' views now on 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 Brexit. Um, where do you think we're going to get on this Northern Ireland question? And importantly, since you cover Brussels and Berlin as well, you know, wh what's the, what's the, what's the European reaction going to be, um, on this? To be, to be honest, I think from, from the, from the European side, I think the focus has been very much on, on Boris Johnson as a, uh, as a personality, let's say. Uh, but, but I think it ultimately, you know, kind of also reflects a certain lack of understanding probably of these, some of these structural driving forces and divisions and fragmentations that we have just been, um, uh, just been talking about that are ultimately behind, behind all of this here in, 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 in British, in British politics from, from the European side. Um, where does this take us on the, on the Brexit front? I mean, my fundamental view you know, from the day that we that we ultimately had the the the, the Brexit deal, and it was clear that that, that the UK would not leave uh, with without a deal. My fundamental view from that day hasn't changed, which is this will drag on for at least a decade. And I think we're very much we're very much on on, on route for that uh, for that kind of forecast to to probably to probably hold uh, hold true. These questions are, are very 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 technically difficult um, when it when it controls in, in, in the Irish Sea and, and, and Northern Ireland. They're obviously politically politically very, very charm. And I think uh, fundamentally behind that are very deep questions that are that are still unresolved. I mean, the only way to really in a meaningful way lower the degree of controls that would be required within the UK between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, that, that route ultimately leads through greater alignment on you know product standards health and safety standards and so on and so forth so that leads us back to you know debates that, that we have led on on this call many many years ago um uh, all throughout that 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 whole brexit um brexit conversation i think most of this stuff still still hasn't been resolved and without that happening i think the best we can the, the best we can hope uh, hope for is, is 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 perhaps some some atmospheric changes um in 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 the short term but I don't think that this question will be will be fundamentally resolved so that we can finally put all these big remaining Brexit questions um, uh, uh, to, to the side, unfortunately. And William, you know, not completely unrelated to all of that, of course, has been the looming uh, ongoing question of Scotland uh, out there. And of course, the first minister has continued to to, to push this kind of procedurally and uh, uh, um, with, with with London and Westminster. But. How, what, what next on the Scotland front, um, in your in your view? 
Well, this also will go on for some time, uh, I think. I don't think there will be any referendum in the near future. Um, what Nicola Sturgeon, the Scottish First Minister, is doing, it's the political equivalent of um, boiling a kettle slowly. You know, it's like saying to her own supporters, look, I am, I'm going to boil this kettle of independence. We're going to bring it to the boil, this issue. We're having a referendum as soon as we can. But at the same time, not really wanting it to boil over anytime soon, because the Scottish nationalists couldn't be confident of winning a referendum. It's more like using the um, excuse of, of wanting a referendum and the British government refusing to let them have them to rally more support for independence and to keep politics in Scotland defined by that issue. Um, and that is likely to happen, that it's still defined by that issue over the next two or three years. I would expect, looking at it objectively, that there will eventually be another referendum in Scotland in the, um, in the, in the 2020, you know, in the second half of the 2020s. Um, and that at the moment we can't predict the outcome of that. But it's still a few years away and the Scottish nationalists will not be able to, to bring it about in the, in the very near future. And the interesting question here, of course, Kevin, if I can just ju jump in here very quickly, is um, how does all of this play out in the scenario, in the probably most likely scenario, if you, if you look at the polls of a, um, of, of a Labour minority government, right, which would perhaps have to rely on some sort of toleration, outside support, whatever you want to call it, um, from, from the SNP, right? Is it politically feasible for the SNP to, let's say, tolerate a Labour minority government without insisting on such a referendum, and obviously vice versa, right? Is it possible for a minority Labour prime minister to grant uh, another referendum in return for support in Parliament from the SNP? We've been talking a lot about fragmentation within the political right, within the Conservative Party, and that's fair enough. But obviously, we need to, we need to look at the left as well, and we need to see that the only way, as, as the polls currently stand, towards a, um, towards a Labour prime minister would really lead to some form of coalition government propped up by, by, by the SNP. And so this kind of like new cleavage, you know, that emerges there um, in, in Scottish politics, which is really a story, of course, of, 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 of an area of electoral support that Labour has lost over the last couple of years. I think that is very much leaving its mark on, on, on the prospects of a, of a centre-left government, if you like. Yes, it is. that's exactly right. And uh, that's why I say that um, your expectation has to be that there's a referendum in the second half of the 2020s, because um, unless the Conservatives can keep on winning an overall majority, you know, the election after election, uh, then eventually you get this scenario where a minority government in London needs to do some sort of come to an arrangement with the Scottish Nationalist government in Scotland. Uh, therefore, the, 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 the possibility of heading that off relies on a Labour revival in Scotland. And uh, much is being made by people in the Labour Party at the moment that the, the leader of the Scottish Labour Party has now got higher personal approval ratings than Nicola Sturgeon, the Scottish Nationalist First Minister, and they think that's the beginning of you know, Scotland going back in a Labour direction. Uh, but it would have to go quite a long way back in a Labour direction to save them from having the problem that Carsten describes. And, and therefore, it is a pretty unstable outlook on Scotland um, over the rest of the decade. And William, you mentioned, you know, irrespective of who take, uh, takes Downing Street, um, that you expect that the, the, that the leadership and support that the UK has shown on Ukraine uh, should continue. But in terms of the more, bro more broadly, in terms of foreign policy, and particularly with relations with the United States, um, you know, Carson's already talked about EU relations vis-a-vis uh, -vis Brexit. But in terms of, you know, obviously one of the taglines of Brexit was global Britain. Um, its relationship with the United, the United States is a critical one. Um, its re relationship with China, also a, 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 a critical one as it continues to, to be an international economic power um, and, 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 uh, and a forward deployed military power, uh, you know, not least with the new AUKUS deal with Australia and the United States, et cetera. How do you, do you see any evolution in terms of British foreign policy? Well, I think any new prime minister is going to try to show they can 
put even more energy into that agenda, not a change of direction, but yeah, they will expect to have close alliance with the United States. They will be looking to do a free trade deal with India um, or, or some sort of, you know, some sort of milestone deal that leads eventually to a free trade deal with India. Uh, yes, to build on the new uh, AUKUS alliance, um, to do more deals like the one just done with New Zealand that improves the mobility, uh, youth mobility in between New Zealand and the and the UK, um, to uh, live up to having a, a, a big development budget again, to taking our development budget back to 0.7% of uh, GDP, so one of the biggest in the world, being in the front line of the Ukraine crisis. So that, there's no doubt it's still in the DNA of British prime ministers, including all these three who might be elected prime minister now to, um, you know, to, for Britain to still punch above its weight, as, um, as we've always said. So I want to I sort of come to the close here by asking you both about something. Maybe, Carson, I'll start with you, because you wrote about this in a, in a note to, uh, to earlier this week. Um, and it's very intriguing um, because in in general, much has been made of that that democracy has in kind of uh, been in retreat. Not not only that there are fewer democracies in the world than there were at the turn of the century, but that the institutions of democracy have been in retreat in some of the major countries uh, of the world, not least of which, of course, is the United States. And in fact, some commentators um, have uh, have been out there. Uh, talking about parallels between Johnson's resistance in leaving office and Trump's unwillingness to accept um, uh, defeat. Um, and I want you to talk a little bit about the difference between normal, normal-ish political turmoil and actual institutional stability. Because it seems to me that the institutions of state of, uh, of the United Kingdom have performed as they uh, exactly as they should, and in fact, the prime minister himself, even though he tried to hold on and hold on to his, you know, his, his supporters, ultimately did not try to do something that would have been constitutionally challenging, like try to bring the queen into some sort of battle over a snap election or something of that sort. Talk about the institutional strength of the, uh, of, of the country here and what that, what that means. Yeah, and I, I think that that's, that's a very important point, right? Because if you look at this whole story kind of over the more longer term horizon from, let's say, from an investor perspective, right, then that is obviously a question that, that you want to ask yourself, right? What does this whole story um, tell me um, about, about the quality of democratic institutions, as, as you were just saying, um, in, in the UK? And that is why, why I found these, these comparisons uh, with, uh, you know, 6th of January in, in the US and, and so on, um, uh, com completely, completely, mis completely misplaced because you're you're dealing with a prime minister who has, granted, has made a point out of being, let's say, anti-establishment, anti-anti-system, and you know, from a, from a perspective of democratic representation, whether you like Brexit, whether you like Boris Johnson or not, has been quite successful at bringing bringing in, bringing back in certain certain parts of the electorate who who perhaps had been had been had been lost over um, over previous years and, and and decades from from the political process but i think if you if you really if you want to assess that question i think it's very important to differentiate between the kind of the storm in the party political system of the uk that we've been talking about here and i think it's it's only right to say that the challenges for for both major parties are extreme and to point to the kind of often chaotic outcomes that this has produced on the personnel selection front, on the policy front, over the last couple of years. I think that's totally fair. But that is the party political side of it. The other side is the question of democratic institutions and ultimately the peaceful transition of power. And if you look back here, um, I mean, once the, let's say the, the most senior ministers in Boris Johnson's government had decided they wanted him out, it took him what? It took them what? An, an, another, another 48 hours, let's say. And all of this happening, uh, on the basis on the basis of an unwritten constitution, really the, the importance of tradition and, and convention, really. Um, so I think the message here on, on that front, on the institutional stability front, uh, is much more encouraging um, than a kind of often chaotic picture that the party politics um, has been has been presenting over the last couple of years. Yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this on this subject, uh, William. Well, I won't repeat. I, I, I agree with what Carsten just said uh, very strongly, and I won't um, repeat that. And, and just think of examples we've had in our discussion where the political system is quite different from the United States. 
the members of parliament are choosing two candidates to be the leader of the party and the party members the primary part of it as it were is only to choose between two candidates who have been selected by the members of parliament now imagine how different things might be in america if the primaries took place between two candidates in each party selected by the members of Congress. Um, I doubt there would have been a President Trump in that situation, uh, for instance. Um, so the very important differences between how our political systems operate and no political appointment of judges uh, in the UK, even to the Supreme Court. Um, no um, apportionment of, of districts um, other than by an independent commission um, that is not partisan. So, very, so the institutions are um, different. But also, I think the main point to add is this is all of a reflection of, a fact that, of the fact that um, Britain, I'm happy to say at the moment, is not as um, uh, culturally or socially divided um, as at least from this side of the Atlantic, it looks like the United States is. Um, we've had these big differences over Brexit, but as I've just been arguing earlier, there aren't really huge differences over economic policy, over the whole direction of uh, economic policy. There is no real national debate on um, abortion, for instance. Um, religion plays a very small role uh, in our political life. Um, the Conservative Party, while being well, still broadly fiscally conservative, we shall see after this election, is fiscally conservative but socially liberal. Um, and uh, you know that would be an interesting combination from uh, an American uh, point of view. So, um, so no, it, it is still a robust um, democratic system here, and faced with a prime minister who had gone a bit rogue. Well, the political system, including the ruling party, spat him out and um, did it very decisively once it had made up its, uh, you know, once, once it had come to that view, as Carlton said, it didn't take it very long to do something about it. You know, finally, uh, William, I wanted to, if I may, just sort of switch subjects here uh, since I've got you um, here today. You know, during your time as foreign secretary, uh, you you overlapped with the early years of Shinzo Abe's second term uh, as uh, as prime minister of Japan, starting in 2012. You know, in the wake of uh, of his tragic and, and just absolutely senseless murder last week, um, I'd love to hear your kind of observations of of working with him and, you know, and your thoughts on on his legacy. Well, he was great to work with because, of course, um, first of all, Japan has had periods of uh, where prime ministers have turned over very quickly. Um, and uh, Mr. Abe was there for a long time, brought policy stability and really dominated the political scene. You know, the economic policy was constructed of Japan around his views and um, incremental changes of defense policy. Uh, and a very warm and close alliance with the United Kingdom as with the United States. So as you can imagine, in the, in the, when I was in government foreign secretary, we saw a lot of him. Um, he was also very, um, uh, he, he was very approachable, very accessible um, in the sense of really enjoying a a conversation with with other politicians from around the world, and um, often, I mean, I love uh, Japan, and and I always um, enjoy all meetings with Japanese leaders. But um, he was less formal than a lot of the Japanese leaders. You know, he's he's one who will slap you on the back, who will um, who will really joke with you. And even after I'd left office as foreign secretary, he was willing to see me when you know he was still the prime minister. I would go and see him in Tokyo when I didn't hold office anymore, but he still wanted to have a chat and to talk about the world. So this was a great leader, and uh, it is an absolute tragedy what has happened. Um, I think, however, he has left behind him a, a clear direction in Japan, and um, Fumio Kishida, the prime minister now, who was my counterpart, though I know him, uh, I knew him then reasonably well. 
now has had this big election victory. And so um, I think we'll be able to take Japan more decisively in the direction of um, recovering some of its role in the, in the world, which it's ready to do in terms of higher defense expenditure um, and being part of maintaining a strategic balance in the Asia Pacific. Um, so I think that will be part of Abe's um, legacy. But a great man, wonderful to deal with. Uh, it's one of those um, horrible tragedies of politics that has no real rationality uh, behind it and it is utterly shocking in a, in a country that has so very little gun crime. Of course, it's really very rare. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we will miss him. We will all miss him personally and politically. Um, all of us who've been dealing with foreign policy in the last decade or two will really miss him. Well, thank you for that. And, uh, and and gentlemen, I don't know if you know this or not, but here in the U.S., um, the famous program Saturday Night Live, um, when their guests have been on five times or more, they get this velvet uh, dressing gown, the Five Timers Club. Both of you are now deserving uh, of, of that because you've been on our, our, our show and um, and uh, and our audience uh, has always responded well. So thank you so much for, for being here. We'll watch the progress of the uh, – uh, you know, of the of the of the prime minister uh, being determined over the next few weeks, and uh, and and we'll probably have to regroup um, after that. So I want to thank everybody for joining us today on this. Uh, I know it was a different time and a different day than we normally do, but wanted to uh, wanted to get out there with uh, our views uh, on um, on this developing political story in the United Kingdom. Uh, please join me two weeks from now. Our next program uh, will we'll feature David Sanger. He's the chief Washington correspondent and uh, senior White House and national security correspondent of The New York Times. Many of you see his byline on the front page almost daily. Um, until then, thank you again for joining me. Thank you to Lord Haig of Richmond and Karsten Nickel. Appreciate you guys joining as ever. Uh, until next time, I'm Kevin Kajawara in New York. Thank you. Thank you.